retired. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Cindy Arnson. I'm the director of the um, Latin American program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's a pleasure to welcome you all, especially those of you who have flown across the Atlantic um, to be with us um, for this important discussion. We meet this morning to consider divergent perspectives in the international community over how and whether to engage Cuba. In many respects, I think the quality of our inquiry um, depends on the quality of our questions. And so I'd like to take a few minutes here at the outset to outline some of the basic ones that will underlie today's discussion. First, to what extent does the transfer of power from Fidel to Raul Castro mark not just a change in personality at the head of the regime, but also meaningful changes in the goals and policies of the Cuban Revolution? If there is a reform process underway, does it include political liberalization? And if so, what is the role of the international community in deepening such transformation? Second, what should be the terms of engagement in the political, economic, and cultural spheres? Does engagement per se in the diplomatic and commercial arenas contribute to change over time by its very nature? Or should such engagement be withheld pending improvements in human rights and political freedoms on the island? Third, what are the existing convergences and divergences within the international community in the specific policy areas of trade, migration, energy, and human rights? Will Spain's presidency of the European Union, beginning in just a few months at the beginning of 2010, take European policy in a new direction? What is the Cuba policy of the Obama administration? What are its goals and its policy instruments? And what are the domestic U.S. constituencies <coughs> pressing for a change in the relationship or insisting on continuation of a policy of isolation? Within the Western Hemisphere, does the OAS uphold a double standard with respect to the applicability of the Democratic Charter to Cuba's readmission to that body? The list goes on and on. I'd like to turn quickly to our panelists to begin to shed light on some of these key issues. Um, before beginning, I'd also like to extend a warm um, and special thank you to Klaus Linsenmeier and to Sebastian Greffe of the Heinrich Boll Foundation, um, who, has, um, who have partnered with us um, in today's meeting, and also to Holger Henke of York College and the City University of New York Research Foundation. I'd also like to ex um, extend special thanks to my colleague, Jose Raul Perales, in the Latin American program, our senior program associate, um, who has put this morning's program um, together. Um, without further ado, I'll turn the microphone over to Ambassador John Maisto, um, uh, who will be the commentator on, on this morning's panel, um, and also to, uh, uh, is it Klaus, you're going to be... Right. Um, I think, um, as I understand, we should have the presentations and uh, the ambassador Perfect. comment on that Perfect. later on. Uh, Klaus that's what I understand from Thank you very much. As Thank a you. humble moderator, understand uh, uh, the scenario. Um, Welcome um, from my side also, mucho gusto, uh, uh, velos todos aquí. Um, I'm Klaus Linsenmeier. I'm head of the uh, Washington office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Uh, before, I was head of the international division in Germany. You know, the foundation has 28 international offices I had to supervise. Unfortunately, not yet any in Cuba, but maybe in the future um, that will happen. Um, we have two panels today. Uh, we start with the European perspective on Cuba. Um, this term is maybe a little bit misleading already. You know, um, if you are familiar with Europe, we have a landscape of uh, positions, so, and I think that we get a, an overview about all these landscapes here. Let me briefly introduce uh, the uh, distinguished panel we have here to get an, an insight into European discussions into, um, on, on Cuba. First, I have the pleasure to introduce you Anna Ayuso Pozzo. She's program director, doctor of international public law and masters in, in European studies, professor at the Autonomous University in Barcelona, and uh, a specialist in the relations between the uh, European Union and uh, Latin America. Um, 
as a second speaker. Then we will have Dr. Karl Buck. He has a long-standing experience in Latin America and is head of the division Latin America and the general secretary of the Council of Ministers of the European Union, though this will be a little bit more, as far as I understand, uh, official position of uh, uh, the European Union, um, but you can make that clear afterwards also. Um, uh, the third speaker will be uh, Stephen Wilkinson from the London Metropolitan University. He is faculty member of the uh, Institute for International, uh, um, International Institute for the Study of Cuba um, and is, uh, uh, his thesis, uh, thesis had a title, uh, Detective Fiction in Cuban Society and Culture. So, um, and afterwards, as mentioned already, um, we will have the, the pleasure of uh, um, uh, Ambassador Maestro to comment on that. He has a long-standing um, uh, practical experience in diplomacy in, in Cuba. I don't read the long list, uh, maybe that's at hand for you, um, otherwise we lose too much time, but uh, I can promise it's a very in-depth uh, and knowledgeable person um, uh, with us now. So let's start. Um, please, um, it's your turn. We have now, um, as I understand, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Yeah, so can we get any um, technical help for that? Because I'm uh, not sure. I can sit there. Yeah, sure, of course. Can I sit there? Just go over there. The idea is uh, having some brief presentations of about 10, 15 minutes, and then we immediately open up to uh, uh, the audience to give you the possibilities to, to uh, join in and uh, to have a, a real lively discussion. So, please. So, uh, it's, it's, you can hear me? You get more. It's okay? Yeah? Speak up. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I want uh, to be here. Uh, I'm not really a specialist in Cuban affairs, but in Latin American and Spanish affairs, so, but I, I'm doing uh, some comments. Uh, I'm going fast because I have <laughs> we have no, a lot of time. As you see, uh, I'm going to talk about Spanish foreign co policy to Cuba, and um, I'm not going to do a review, an historic review, but only to do some general characteristics and points, some weak points and strong points, and some suggestions what it's going to, to do uh, in the next time. So I said, well, the title of the, the presentation is um, uh, sailing between two waters. Why? Because the Spanish politic to Cuba is have uh, some dualities, that it's uh, always moving in between do, two, two choices in, in different ways. So first, the Spanish policy is between two continents, Europe and Latin America. It's been it's part of two different dialogues with Latin America, the Euro-Latin American uh, dialogues and also the Euro-American community. And in this, uh, this is space, the sensibilities and the approaches are different. The second duality is, this, is because, and this is, I think, some common point with the United States, for, for Spain, uh, the relation with Cuba is not only an international issue, but also a domestic affair. This is because, uh, first, the, the two main parties in Spain have opposite positions, and second, because uh, Cuba is also uh, a, a question that has a high uh, level of sensibility in the Spanish public opinion. So the next duality is because two policy-oriented actions do it to, to these different positions of the two main parties. The fourth is, uh, so that means that as a result of the Spanish, the, this, this opposition, the policy to Cuba oscillates depending on the result of the elections. So when the, 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 it's a socialist this, uh, government, they, they took the way to the constructive engagement. When it's the, the conservative government, it's the coercive policy. That means that it makes inconsistencies on the time of this policy. The next duality is because pragmatism and voluntarism. Why? Even the ideological disparity between the two governments, they have some common points. This is when it, it, it's <laughs> political affairs, they are voluntarism. They want to change things in one or another direction, but they want to do something. But when it takes about economic issues, they are pragmatic. That means that even in the worst times of crisis between the two governments, the economic activity was stable. 
So, and that means also that they have frequent inconsistencies between the discourse uh, and the reality, uh, the, the, the what it's uh, doing in the in, in reality, and uh, always prevail the national interest when it was uh, in danger in the economic affairs. So the next uh, duality is between public and private. That means that mm, that's true that official contacts have been fluctuants due to the reasons I said, but the private uh, contacts were always uh, very uh, stable. Non-official contacts have been growing consistently, including business, NGOs, local corporation, and uh, local authorities, universities, scientists, and that permitted to maintain the level of cooperation even when the official uh, <coughs> contacts were good. They have a, a compensation um, flow, uh, a compensation effect. So that permits to identify two uh, different factors, the stability and instability. The stability factor are the economic mutual interest, the wide net of institutional relations on different levels and personal relations. Instability factors are political polarization, unilateral conditionality, and high discretionality in the policy behavior of both sides, Spanish and uh, Cuban. More in Cuban probably, but also. So in that we can find weak points and some stronger points. The weak points is to, to, to improve uh, the, the relationship. The, the weak points is the weakness of Cuban economy that impede the increase of the economic relations. The dependence of natural resources, low competitivity, high level of indebtedness, low agricultural productivity, among others. The other constraint is from the low impact of cooperation policy because of its fragmentation. The governmental, non-governmental uh, cooperation and all the actors are not coordinated. So that it's a uh, lack of uh, uh, <coughs> impact of this cooperation. Other problem is the high bureaucracy and centralism that is inefficient and the lack of, uh, uh, of the rule of law and the high discretionality in the economic decisions that Cuban authorities that prevent the investment because they're not predictability. And the, the last one, but not the less, is the lack of freedom, rights, and the low individual autonomy and the absence of incentives to private initiatives that is strong, the, 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 the economy. The stronger points on the other side is the stability integrity exchange and, the, and a little bit less and investment flows, uh, the wide cultural and scientist cooperation, the increasing number of actors involved in the relationship, and the existence of some instruments to, institu to, to institutionalize the, the, the relationship, like the investment agreements, the double tax agreement, the cooperation commission that gives some continuity to the, acti to the activity. And also we have some strong sectors who are big position uh, the Spanish uh, cooperation in tourism sec sector. So something, something about the Spain and Eu European Union uh, policy. Spain is a strong, uh, relevant actor in the European Union-Cuban relation, and its initiative uh, have consequences in changes of the European poli position. So the inconsistency of uh, the Spanish policy to Cuba affects in the same direction the Eu European Union consistency of policy. I th well, we'll see what it says uh, Carl. But um, uh, this, there is not only the only cause of this inc inconsistency, also there are inconsistency between the different in European institutions. Uh, the Commission, Council, and European Parliament are not in the same way sometimes. And this is because there is a lack of consensus between European members, and in my opinion, that makes that uh, the, 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 the unanimity rules on external relations decision making <coughs> in, in the European Union play against the soft play against the, 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 the soft policies because this needs more uh, consensus and longer time to be implemented and when it's broke it takes a long time to rep replace to, to, to rebuild all this so um, it should be careful when you change this, this, this policy. And um, 
this in, uh, the lack, uh, uh, this inconsistency uh, of about the European policy con contributes to increase the relevance of other actors. It's not finished, uh, like Venezuela, Brazil, Canada, China, and in a European Union is losing relevance in in Cuba. So that's for finish. Uh, I think it's quite fast. <laughs> for finish, I have some uh, some uh, things that. Uh, how to improve the coherence and effectiveness of uh, European and Spanish cooperation. The first, the first thing is we need to build an, an internal European consensus to work in medium term. That means establish a consensus based in concrete <laughs> objectives, but not only in precondition like now. So condition could be an instrument, but never an objective. So conditions should be negotiated with pragmatists, with Cuban authorities, and that needs some flexibility in what is these conditions. And uh, well, that means th the other question. So it should be negotiated in a framework of mutual engagement. That means that should be negotiation again and agreement. We need uh, an agreement that they have been trying to, to do for a long time, I think I thought that the the, the, the context of the ACP uh, agreement was the best. But yesterday I was talking just with Carl and, and Susanne, and it seems that it's not the choice. But in, even if it is a bilateral or multilateral uh, agreement, I think multilateral could be better, but probably not. We can discuss about it. Uh, but uh, even if it's one or another, we need this agreement not only to 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 help for the the the, the commercial flows, but also to have a more coordinated cooperation policy to Cuba with other actors, European countries, European Commission, and other actors, governmental or non-governmental, and that this is also helpful to reduce the discretionality of the policies by establishing legal instruments that regulate ordinary procedures for decision making and to solve the controversies between the partners in ordinary channels. The other question is, we, I think we have to conduce the human rights questions to international institutions and giving priority, I think, to the regional ones and involving rele relevant actors in the region like Brazil, <coughs> Canada, Mexico, and other countries more uh, like uh, pro-human rights, like Costa Rica. So the other thing we, we should do is to support the economic uh, reforms, to strong the support to economic reforms, cooperate to create conditions to growth by economic reforms, to increase the competitivity, to the reduce the external debt, to decentralize it, to improve the agricultural productivity and the internationalization of the economy. Even if they are small, any reform in these sectors is, should be reinforced and supported because it's something that is get, uh, establishing cha little changes, but it's important to, to do that. And the other is the building capital, social capital. That means intensify people-to-people -people relationship by, by European and human exchange, increase scientific cooperation, scholarships, grants, professional training, new administrative management, entrepreneurial organization, financial management. Even if it, it's small, these changes is also good. It's and uh, the last thing I think we should uh, talk on and it's strong uh, to work is identify the key actors of the transition process and facilitate dialogue for reconciliation. That means facilitate the context between different social sectors inside and outside Cuba and from the establishment and the, 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 the opposition. So the, the objective of, of that is finish with the Cuban exceptionality and normalize the, the, the relation to, because the past experience shows that uh, the lower profile of politics is more useful, more, more uh, effective than the public pressures. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Anna. Um, I just hand over to um, Karl Buck uh, for his contribution. Um, <coughs> yours. Thank you. Do you understand me like that? Good, great. Well, you 
ask me to present something more official. I'm not sure if I, I should do that uh, because official positions are normally pretty boring. What I'm more intending to do, and the more since I'm retired since two months, is uh, to emphasize certain of the lessons on substance and on procedure we learned or we should have learned. Um, the topic is engaging Cuba, and that topic is slightly more complicated than a, a topic engaging in Cuba. Engaging Cuba, I think, is ambitious, if not pretentious, but we must, of course, try it. Cuba itself is engaged and heavily engaged in the world. There's no doubt about it. Its international standing has dramatically improved the couple, last couple of years. Uh, denying it would be a very bad start for relations with Cuba and counterproductive. In this context, by the way, you just mentioned Latin America. I've become rather skeptical about Latin American engagement in what we consider important in Cuba, like human rights, democracy and all that. They have been consistently absent and will not willing to do so, with very few exceptions in the past. Mm. So we have to take this also as a fact. Um, now, we should engage Cuba and in Cuba, but in a way which, as Marifeli Perez Stable said, should not make us hostage of Havana's veto. And unfortunately, most of what the EU had intended to do beyond the common position, which I'm going to explain shortly, is leading to a certain hostage situation, just as the US position did also. Now, that's a, such a situation is not only inefficient, it's also humiliating and doesn't give you too much credibility. But I leave it to the U.S. partners to present their different views, and I know there are the different views here from old friends, um, to go into that. Well, as I said, I, I would emphasize lessons we learned or should have learned. In the process of the last years, when we resumed dialogue, which had been blocked in 2003, and for good reasons, uh, but unexpected for us. Um, we were faced with Cuban conditions, as I said, over time, since 2007. Now, when Cuban uh, visitors came to me, I always expected the same kind of arguments. Uh, and then when the conditions came, I, I showed them the globe on my table and said, let's have a look. Here is Cuba and let's turn around, and there's the EU. So let's talk about conditions. What we did consistently, and I think with a lot of success, we're clearing the underwood from unnecessary, unjustified, arbitrary, wrong interpretations or opinions by Cuba, and thus prepared for a more sober dialogue to which we're, I think we are back. For example, if Cuba insulted us, la callos de Washington, I took the liberty of insult back, of insulting back. Or I took the liberty to recall that respeto should hold both ways. Let me be very clear. I'm absolutely in favor of dialogue and cooperation, but at the same level. Yeah? Or when we were accused of double standards in human rights because we did not allegedly comment on Guantanamo and other things, I said, okay, if that's your definition of double standard, I accept it. But under these, this definition, Cuba also is applying double standards. And I said, to him, where is the Cuban resolution on the situation in Zimbabwe or on Darfur and so on? So by consistently undoing their arguments, which we considered unde undefendable, we cleared the way. This was also true for what is unfortunately still called the 2003 sanctions. And I'm blaming Dan Erickson and Susanne for using them again. I have it here. <laughs> These are measures. These are measures. <laughs> if you use the word sanctions, the Cuban propaganda machine has won. Because that's their term. It's not a sanction. What a sanction is, for example, that we tried to invite the Cuban opposition to National Day celebrations in Havana. I put the argument back to the Cuban and said, Cuban ambassadors have been close friends to me, I would say. Look, when you hold Cuban National Day in Brussels, nobody protests if you invite communists, Marxists, Trotskyists, all people who want to undo our system. Huh? So let's start dialogue on the same level. Now, 
As I said, we must do something which doesn't make us a hostage. Of course, the problem is what are our interests? This question has been left unanswered by Marie Feli. And are there any rankings in our interests? The EU position continues for the moment to be based on the common position. And although it has been blamed and criticized by many as being a product of a right-wing coalition between Eisenstadt and Asnar at the time, if you read it carefully, it's worth reading it, you find this document a rather constructive one. Of course, there's critique of, yes, Susanne, I still defend it. Um, there is critique of human rights and so on, but the major essential sentences are explicit rejection of coercive means, and there's a difference between us and the U.S. policy, explicit wording saying it is for Cuban people to decide on their future, explicit offer of dialogue and cooperation, not conditional dialogue and co cooperation, by the way. I've been negotiating this, these things. The word is full cooperation is given in the process. That means that before such a process already some cooperation is given. And we did. Between 1993 and 2003, when Castro unil Fide Fide unilaterally uh, froze the cooperation, we had been giving something like uh, 130 million of uh, euros in cooperation. Most of this, and that's again part, uh, uh, f flows out from the common position, most of this was supporting reform processes, which Cuba wanted and needed after the Soviet aid was, was no longer available. So, for example, European professors were giving classes on not only management to 500 uh, executives in, 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 in Cuba, but also uh, classes on labor law, because suddenly the Cubans had to, to think about aspects like that, or financing social security, things like that. Now, of course, you can put the question, aren't we, by such a cooperation, contributing to the st stabilization of the system? The question is a good one. I come to it later. Um, I would like to make a diff uh, an important, uh, 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 a short um, comment on the procedures we have. It is important, if you want to do and change politics, to understand how you can do it. The common position is a binding legal instrument, binding for all, but it gives some flexibility. Legal instruments can be changed or eliminated by what we call legal unanimity. Legal unanimity in the EU is if nobody says no. I've seen decisions where one said yes and all the other 26 abstained from saying anything. That was unanimity. That is very important because it makes it relatively easy to change this composition if one wants, and I have no problem with changing it. Um, whereas the 2003 measures were a political decision and could only be changed or eliminated by consensus. That means everybody has to say yes. And I admit, I was completely surprised that we succeeded this in 2007. So it's important to, to, to keep this in mind. Um, the elimination of the composition, as I said, would do no harm. But what then? Cuba wants contractual relations with us. Now, there are different possibilities you could foresee. Start with a simple trade agreement. Okay, simple trade agreements in our tradition do not necessarily need what we call the Human Rights and Democracy Clause, which could be a major obstacle. So there is a way. We had such a discussion on flexibilization of our clauses in the context of South Korea. But let's face it. Not everybody is convinced that Cuba is at the same level of importance to us as South Korea. Second option, what we call a third or fourth generation uh, agreement. There, until now, we had to have a rather astonishing number of clauses, which are all well meant, but there are too many. And they include, certainly, the Human Rights and Democracy Clause. And this would be, in my view, a major problem for all 27 to say yes. I am proud to say that until now, the EU, starting from extremely opposite positions, takes Spain and Czech Republic on the one. We always succeeded in coming to consensus on the 
annual re-evaluation of the common position, sometimes in the recent past even without mentioning it, it anymore. Yeah? So we do have an enormous flexibility and, and compromise uh, system, but I'm not too sure if that would hold for the human rights clause to be abandoned. We had experience of that kind when in the early 2000 and I think 2002, Cuba had considered twice to become member not only of the ACP group, Africa, Carib uh, Caribbean, Pacific, but of the agreement of Cotonou between the EU and the ACP. Twice this could not be done because in la rather late stages of uh, contacts, some member states said no, uh, claiming that uh, the human rights clause uh, would not allow Cuba to, to join the, the Cotonou agreement which I considered rather unfortunate at the time and not very convincing because there is a considerable number of ACP countries who are certainly in a human rights and democracy situation which is not worse than the Cuban one. Yeah? So this is a bit of an unfortunate evolution in the EU. This leads me to one problem. The EU as a level player has seriously suffered from, uh, from lack of credibility. Not because we, are, we badly intended, but because since quite some time, member states who had perfectly smooth running trade relations with Cuba were among the toughest on the EU level as concerns Cuba. And this, of course, does not go unnoticed to a brilliant uh, diplomacy as the Cuban is. And so the EU as such, as a level, has lost credibility, impact, and so on. We can regain that, but uh, I'm not too sure how much uh, this will be possible. I'm not going now in, the, in details of the uh, most recent uh, resumed cooperation, but we have resumed. The Commissioner has again been there. Uh, again, this cooperation, which will run into some 40 million uh, euros for the moment, is, orga is organized in two ways. First, to help support certain reform processes which are going on. I mentioned the management, which was quite well done by Raul Castro <coughs> since 20 years, the improvement of management by, uh, by military people. Uh, this was supported by us. It will be supported. At, it doesn't have to be uh, military, of course. Uh, again, reform processes. Why? Because the EU thinks that every, uh, development all, altogether can help improve the daily grievances, which exist seriously, of the population in Cuba. And we have an optimism that development in the long run has a good chance to lead into more democratic situations. Um, other fields of cooperation are where Cuba is of interest, and Cuba is of interest. Take one example which went hardly noticed. Two years ago, a German Land, who is not known for its extreme leftist government, Bavaria, concluded uh, research agreements with Cuba of up to 300 million. That shows how interesting Cuba is in certain fields, without any doubt. No? The third uh, um, emphasis of the new cooperation is what Cuba de really needs, that is food security, agricultural reform, production, and so on. And in my as I said, I'm, I'm pretty frank with Cuban ambassadors and Cuban visitors. In my context, I always put one question. Explain me one thing. Cuba is in the tropics and needs to import 80% of its food. Compare it with Israel, who is in the desert. Something is wrong. Yeah? Okay. How shall all this end? Well, we can foresee that the common position is eliminated as the Cubans so much want. That is possible. We've been doing the most unexpected things, as I said in the past. The, but eliminating the common position is not yet the answer to the, the future relations. I, put that, uh, I, I explained that. We can have more engagement in Cuba and possibly with Cuba. There are possibilities considered of trilateral cooperation, EU, Cuba, and other countries. Now, the, that is an extremely sensitive issue for the moment still, because many member states do not see a, a lot of advantage that Cuba improves its own already good image in certain uh, developing countries with EU aid. 
this is a political consideration, whereas Cuba has a lot to offer uh, on, in certain fields, and um, you only become popular, as Cuba does, if you offer 100,000 free operations, or if you, if you improve uh, the health system altogether, if you improve the teaching system altogether. You only become popular, yes. So um, I'm not sure how quickly we shall come to a political uh, decision on trilateral cooperation. There is also, uh, also two other uh, possible evolutions, and I'm finishing on that. One which I called mutual irrelevance. This has always been a possibility and still is at the EU level, as I said. If the EU doesn't get its thing together, and I doubt it will, or put it otherwise, we have a lot of flexibility to member states, and they need that flexibility because home positions are different in Prague and in Spain. Um, in that case, uh, we could have mutual irrelevance of the EU as a level, except cooperation yeah? and political dialogue, whatever that means. Uh, there could be human rights dialogue. I'm not too keen about a separate human rights dialogue with Cuba because our experiences with other partners of the kind are not very promising. And it could be abused to isolate practically this question from the normal running dialogue, which was very frank in the past, by the way, not just me frank. There's another possibility, and we had it in the last years. Uh, Spain took advantage of a situation, and I think it deserves to be commended on that. It did no longer want to be prisoner of difficult decisions, which were mainly caused by certain countries which did not have much national interest in Cuba, but which had a strong Im interest or strong pressure from the NGOs in human rights and, uh, and, and related issues. Uh, Spain used the twice uh, error by the then Czech foreign minister to go its own way. Uh, twice in 2006 and seven, I think it was, the, the Czech minister, whose name happens to be Freedom, I mean, sometimes things happen like that, um, he, 10 minutes after agreeing on consensus, uh, uh, with consensus and con conclusions on Cuba, 10 minutes later he went to the press and said, oh, that doesn't bind us anything. No. Okay, you, don't, you do that once. If you do it the second time, you lose as a negotiating partner. Why should we negotiate with a Czech ambassador if his minister 10 minutes later says, oh, doesn't care. So this was used by Spain as a possibility to go its way. And I think it was clever and it was a defendable. I've called the situation the de-dramatization of relations by bilateralization. And this could go on. To finish EU-US relations, Dan Fisk will recall that. We've been dealing with it. In the past years, even with a Republican president, we've gone a long way in patient talks between Washington and Brussels, between the EU Troika and State Department, to succeed and to eliminate and, or reducing at least conflicts between our respective different policies and behavior, and what is more important, the behavior of our respective clientele in Cuba. We've succeeded um, that Beatriz Roque and uh, Elisardo Sanchez and so on do no longer fight each other more than the common opponent. I'm glad we did that, and uh, we, we congratulate the US State Department on that. There is still, of course, space to improve uh, and uh, to stop what Jake Colvin called stop harassing U.S. allies. The rather petty-minded behavior by the OFAC, punishing U.S. firms doing business in Cuba, is an unnecessary little needle stick. By chance, I'm reading for the moment the history of the break of uh, the United States from the U.K., in the 18th century, and it reminds me a lot that huge administrations are paid for relatively ridiculous amounts of money they, they get out of their job. Huh? Um, one problem I'd like to raise here will come up when real change takes place in Cuba. That is the property issue. We know that the importance of that issue from the German unification, where we had the most serious problems, in finding out who was the owner. It's not as clear as certain legal uh, studies want to make us believe. No? I know there are legal studies, I have them, made by various political groups in the US, 
We should be aware of that problem coming up. We don't have to deal with it now because things do not remain uh, secret. And I'll, I'm, I'm uh, finishing on that. I forgot to mention one problem in the EU. We had a discussion on strategies, long-term strategies and so on. It is practically impossible to have such discussions in the EU because from the very first second there are leaks. We had the discussion in 2006 and 7 on a middle and long-term strategy. In the first week after the term was created, the Cubans officially protested and said, if you continue with such a thing, that's injerencia, that's interference, and we'll stop any contacts. So you have to keep in mind that among the 27, there are various political positions, including some positions very close to Cuba for reasons they can defend. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Karl Abuk. We now um, uh, get a presentation by Stephen Wilkinson from um, London. So, do you get? In I would be fired if I would still be an official. Well, uh, um, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I'm extremely uh, honored to be here. I'd just like to point out that uh, recently I've been given a new position. I'm now the director of the Center for Caribbean and Latin American Research and Consultancy at London Metropolitan University. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, the, the relationship between Europe and the United States and Cuba together. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out that um, there is a difference between the European approach towards Cuba and the United States approach to Cuba, which is fundamental. Although at the outset one would say that both wish to see the Cuban regime uh, change towards uh, a liberal, Western liberal multi-party democracy with a free market economy, that's where the similarities end. That, in fact, the European Union and the United States differ markedly both in goals in Cuba and in the means to attain the goals. And I think it's really important to point this out because uh, it's uh, a real cause, I think, for concern in terms of trying to influence uh, the Cuban government into changing its behavior. The first point is that um, the United States position as enshrined in law uh, from the Helms-Burton Law of 1996 is one of wishing to see a transition which is marked by a complete regime change. In other words, they wish, or uh, is implied, a complete removal of the current government and a replacement of that government by other actors. And the Helms-Burton Law states clearly that the government cannot include any, either of the Castro brothers and calls for the dismantling of most of the institutions of state power uh, in Cuba as presently constituted. Now, if you compare that with the attitude that is enshrined in the common position of also not incidentally, coincidentally, of 1996, um, the European Union favors the idea that uh, the Cuban uh, government can be induced to reform itself and that that is preferable than some kind of cataclysmic change. Now that is a fundamental difference in goals and of course the policies um, in trying to attain those goals reflect a similar difference. Uh, Helms Burton, for example, uh, enshrines the idea that uh, the regime in Cuba has to be punished and it has to be uh, uh, economically embargoed and that this embargo uh, to work needs to be internationalized and the government instructs or the Congress instructs the president to seek an international embargo of Cuba in order to attain those ends. The idea is, is that uh, by economic pressure the regime will be forced into some kind of collapse which will result in the change that is required. Whereas the common position as has been pointed out actually <clears throat> points out that A, it's not desired policy 
that the Cuban people should suffer as a consequence, that uh, cooperation, economic and uh, political cooperation will go on, and therefore isolation is not part of the EU policy at all. So what, what I'm saying is, is that Western Europe and the United States, and the same goes indeed for Japan and Canada, the Western allies of the United States just do not agree with the United States policy towards Cuba, either in the goals or in the means of attaining the goals. And there are fundamental reasons for this. There are some very strong historic differences. Now, uh, we had a very good paper from uh, Anna about Sp Spain's relationship with Cuba, and uh, Carl talked uh, about the EU at, at the EU level, at the Brussels level. Uh, my main area of research has been on the UK's relationship with Cuba over time, uh, but I think most of what I'm going to say applies to most of the European partners. And starting right from the very beginning in 1959, there were fundamental differences between uh, uh, the Europeans and uh, the United States over what to do about Cuba. The first of these centered around the notion that and the experience uh, that the Europeans had of trying to embargo countries and finding that it had the opposite effect of that was required, that the regimes that were embargoed actually got stronger as a consequence of the embargo, they became more self-reliant, and therefore they thought this wouldn't work with Cuba, and they advised the United States not to embargo the, the island at the time, I'm talking now in the very early 1960s, uh, before the missile crisis and so forth. But this attitude is still very prevalent amongst international uh, actors today, Secondly, the embargo at the time would drive Castro into the arms of the Soviets. In other words, it would have the opposite effect that was, that was required. Thirdly, that, that was felt at the time uh, in Europe that Castro actually was not a communist, he was a nationalist, and that he could be steered away from communism if the right policies were adopted. Um, the uh, Macmillan government uh, advised uh, uh, the Kennedy administration quite strongly that they were going to uh, create a problem with, which was not necessary. And once uh, Cuba fell into the arms of the Soviet Union, the Europeans took the view that, um, that Cuba was part of the Soviet orbit and therefore should be treated exactly the same way as the Soviet Union. They didn't embargo the Soviet Union, so why should we embargo Cuba? They didn't see Cuba as a threat to Western security. The Europeans lived with uh, the tanks uh, on the border, uh, right next door to the Soviet Union, they faced the threat every day of missile attack. Uh, the Soviets had surrounded Berlin, etc., etc. They lived right next door to the threat. They didn't see why the United States should get so upset about having an island 90 miles away uh, when they lived with it themselves. So they just didn't see, they didn't see the, the, the uh, psychological impact that uh, the island going communist had, and they were much more sanguine about it. They also had a commitment to maintaining free commerce, particularly the UK. They relied at that time about, for about 50% of the GDP on international trade. They saw the embargo as, as impinging uh, the principle of freedom of trade, and they disagreed with it fundamentally for that reason. They thought the US practiced double standards because, in fact, through subsidiaries at the time, uh, the US was actually trading with Cuba, but it was asking its allies not to. They had misgivings in general about embargoes, which I referred to before. And they saw Cuba as being an American problem, not there, so why should they help the United States over it? And finally, and this is a very important thing that is still relevant today, that in Europe there were powerful left-wing parties that were empathetic or sympathetic towards Fidel Castro, that had a social democratic tradition, welfare states. The idea of socialized medicine wasn't such a tremendously uh, terrible thing to the Europeans. Um, they had mixed economies, and in fact, uh, they, at that time, you, the UK had an, uh, a ma massively nationalized economy. They didn't see nationalizations in Cuba as being anything in particular to worry about. And so for all of these reasons, the Europeans had a fundamentally different approach towards Fidel Castro. They also had significant interests, which are very relevant today. In the Caribbean, there are something like 15% of the uh, population of the Caribbean live in dependent territories. Uh, the Caribbean uh, is, uh, there, are, there are French departments. Very shortly, then the Dutch are going to make their isle, three of their islands uh, municipalities of, of Holland. The UK has huge investment still in most of the former colonies and has two very important offshore banking uh, concerns, the Turks and Caicos and the Cayman Islands, which are very close to Cuba. For all of these reasons, the, uh, 
the uh, Europeans want to see a stable uh, Caribbean. They don't, they don't want to see any kind of conflagration in the area that may affect their interests. But also, there is a drug issue. Most of the cocaine that is consumed in the European uh, countries comes through the Caribbean and through those dependencies, in fact. And the Europeans, all of them, have very strong and uh, detailed uh, police activity in the Caribbean area and they cooperate with the Cubans on this. Interestingly, uh, the Helms-Burton law uh, accuses Cuba of being a drug dealer whereas the UK under the John Major Conservative government signed an agreement to train uh, Cuban police in drugs interdiction and they're very happy with the agreement and say that uh, the Castro government is one of the greatest uh, allies in the fight against drugs in the Caribbean. So there's a fundamental difference of opinion over the two, uh, uh, between the two governments or countries on that issue. There is a very strong migration concern. The fact of these dependencies means there are many, many people one would have to say, and I don't wish to be uh, accused of being racist on this fact matter, but the governments of the European Union are. They do not want to see people of African descent migrating to the European Union from the Caribbean. They want to see the Caribbean prosperous in order that they, they remain there. They do not uh, think that uh, their interest would be best served if there was some kind of economic collapse in Cuba, which would create a maelstrom within the Caribbean that would increase the migration pressure to the European Union, so therefore they have a tendency to want to see Cuba remain stable at least. And uh, there are personal investments. I have to say that, for example, um, the chairman of the Conservative Party in the UK is Michael Ashcroft, and his main fortune is investments in Belize, which is very close to Cuba and receives a great deal of aid from Cuba. It was Michael Ashcroft that took the, foreign, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, William Hague, to Cuba earlier this year when he returned uh, from that visit. Uh, the Conservative uh, uh, for, uh, Secretary, um, Shadow Secretary said that the United States should lift its embargo immediately. And finally, the Europeans settled their claims, the property claims. They didn't have that many in the first place and compared to the United States, but their governments allowed their companies to make a settlement for the nationalizations and to be indemnified by, by the Cubans, and this removed a problem. So for all these reasons, the Europeans have continued to trade with Cuba, to invest in Cuba over time. I'm just going to very briefly take you through a periodization of the relationship. And um, if the as Richard Newshow called it, the embargo policy is a pressure cooker policy which is aimed at trying to create enough pressure within the island to, so that it explodes. Uh, the fact is that it hasn't worked over time and the reason why, the main reason why it hasn't worked is that the, that the Cubans have always, or the Cuban state has always managed to have an escape valve. During the Cold War, the escape valve was provided by the USSR, but the Europeans continued to trade. So no matter how much pressure the US put on Cuba, the Europeans and the USSR between them allowed the nut sufficient pressure to be released so that the regime survived. Things started to change uh, dramatically for the Cubans with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The safety valve of the USSR had gone, but the Europeans continued to trade, and they continued to trade because they objected principally to the extraterritoriality that was enshrined in the Cuba Democracy Act of 1992. And the threat, and it has to be said that this was also said at the time, the threat that the Cuba Democracy Act might have on asphyxiating the Cuban economy and causing a collapse of the Cuban economy. And it was the major government of the UK that sent its trade minister to Cuba in 1993 in order to see how much they can help Cuba survive the economic crisis, was, which was a consequence of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the increased pressure that was being applied by the United States at that time. And that was the principal reason why the regime survived. And uh, as a consequence of its survival, those in the United States that have an interest in this pressured uh, the Congress to pass the Helms-Burton Law, which was really aimed at trying to choke off investment from Western Europe and Canada in Cuba. Um, and uh, that made the uh, the, uh, the Europeans adopt the common position as, okay, as a means to assuage the United States and the kind of deal was struck but the most important point was that the pot still leaked. The Europeans did not pull out of Cuba, they continued to invest. And uh, finally, Bill Clinton in 2000, 1999, just before he left office, loosened the rules regarding travel and remittances and that meant that the pot began to leak on the U.S. side for the first time. 
And then when he came into office, quite surprisingly, George Bush, George W. Bush uh, signed the food exception bill into law, which meant that the U.S. Be has become now one of the major uh, purveyors of food to Cuba in the world. And that means that the pot now is very, very truly hold, and the pressure cannot be applied anymore to Cuba in this sense. Um, and then finally, as the years go by, uh, enter Hugo Chavez and the Chinese, and you have another safety valve. And now the pot is really leaking. And um, if you come up to the present day, Obama is relaxing uh, the pressure even more. So the point I'm making is that over time, the embargo is becoming less and less effective and efficient as a policy. It's becoming less and less meaningful and has to change. Helms Burton policy goal of regime overthrow is less and less achievable by these means. It's not going to happen. Um, the government of Cuba as it stands is going to be the government of Cuba for a long time still to come and we have to get used to that idea. And also because of the uh, lack of effectiveness also of the common position, the common position has not produced reform either in Cuba as she's intended to do. It's now beginning to come under pressure itself and so the Europeans at a time when um, the Obama administration appears to be moving more towards a conditionality reform position towards Cuba, the Europeans are moving even further uh, away from that position. So the likelihood of there being a common approach to Cuba between the US and the European Union is less likely than ever and if really what has to happen really is that the European Union and the Western allies, let's say in general, and the United States adopts the same approach. Because it, unless you do that, what has happened over the past 50 years is that the uh, Cubans have been able to play one off against the other. They've survived. A united front on Cuba would be much more effective in inducing change there. Unless something happens, like for something cataclysmic, like a war in South America, which was mooted a couple of weeks ago, it's probably a flight of fancy, but something, unless something significant changes, the march of the BRIC countries, who are now Cuba's biggest allies, Brazil, India, China, and then you have Russia, all of these countries are investing in Cuba. They are much stronger economic players than they were in the past. Cuba doesn't really need the European Union to survive, and it doesn't really need the United States to survive. It, could, it does need the United States to prosper. And the Castros would like the country to prosper. And I think that ultimately the only way is to release the pressure. And uh, the fact is, is that you shouldn't be too nervous about releasing the pressure because you can always put the pressure back on after you've taken it away. And that would be some, a weapon. Then you would have real leverage. But at the moment, there is no leverage. And that is the most crucial thing. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it was very illustrative, and uh, I like the picture with the pot because it uh, makes many things clear. Um, this is a good um, chance to change perspective now, and um, I give the word to uh, Ambassador Maestro. Just some words on his positions to make clear his uh, outstanding uh, involvement in, in diplomacy and politics over the recent years in the region. He was a uh, permanent representative to the uh, Organization of American States. He was a uh, special advisor as well to uh, former President Bush and Condoleezza Rice. He was ambassador in, in Venezuela, advisor to the U.S. Southern Command um, from 2000 to 2001, um, ambassador in Nicaragua, etc., etc. I leave it by that, so it's a very profound involvement in practical diplomacy in the region. Ambassador, you have the word for your comment. Thank you, Carl, and thank you, Cynthia, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the kind words. <laughs> um, fascinating presentations from all three. I'm torn between wanting to comment on each one of them and going to what I prepared. I think I'll go to what I prepared, and then I'll very briefly have a comment on, on, on each one of them. Um, I recall from my diplomacy days, um, I'm retired, by the way. I speak for myself only. <laughs> Uh, when uh, we engaged with our European friends, with our Spanish friends, engaged with Carl, you, you, um, we were always told, we want the same thing that you want with regard to Cuba. We want democracy, we want human rights, we want all the basic freedoms, but our approach is different. We've heard how the approach is different. 
We've heard about uh, the, the common position and uh, the part of the common position that it is not EU, EU policy to have or to bring about changes by coercive measures with the effect of increasing economic hardships to the Cuban people. And we saw the tools that have been used since the mid-90s. I would suggest that we consider all of this on a backdrop, a both a political and economic backdrop. Uh, the economic one is uh, the, U the EU, collectively, is Cuba's largest economic partner, collectively. Uh, Spain is among the top five individual countries uh, with trade to Cuba. The Spanish role is huge. It's number one in trade. Uh, um, it's number one in joint ventures. 25% of um, uh, uh, develop, uh, um, investment uh, in Cuba is Spanish. Sol Melia is a, is, a, is a hotel empire, almost two dozen hotels there. Um, and then there is something the Spanish always mention in any conversation about Cuba. And that's something I call Spanish sentimentality about Cuba. Uh, every Spaniard you talk to has some sort of link to Cuba. Relatives, cousins, friends, um, uh, vacations, uh, uh, what have you. The Spanish feel a very special link to Cuba that I don't think anybody else, I venture to say anybody else in, in, in Europe um, um, feels. Um, then in general there are, part of the backdrop is the political realities uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and there are pressures indeed uh, from generally, and I think we heard it here, NGOs and uh, political groups that are left of center as opposed to center or center right. Quite a contrast to the United States, by the way. Um, I think it's safe, or it's fair to ask how U UE policy has fared. Between 1996 and 2003, there was lots of economic engagement, not much on human rights, not much on political um, uh, uh, institutions, uh, uh, improving uh, from 2003 to 2008 in the wake of the 75, rest of 75, we saw uh, the, um, the, the policy of uh, measures, some call sanctions, uh, and uh, I can understand why the, our European friends would object to embracing a term that the Cubans have used to describe a situation. Uh, the United States has had that policy for years by having an embargo called a blockade. Um, now, um, there was a split. We know what the split is. We heard about it. Then we had um, the EU in June 2008 unanimously calling for sanctions to be removed, claiming now, quote, now it's going to be a real dialogue, not just two monologues, which is interesting if it works. Um, I think that's questionable. Uh, most recently, we have seen the lead role of the foreign minister of Spain, Martinos, over the past several weeks. Um, he has called for more engagement. He's uh, reached out to the Cuban government on human rights. Three individuals were released. We used to hear this from the Spanish all the time. If you can get real, live human beings that are released from custody, that is progress. That's something to work on. Now, let's contrast that with the U.S. approach. And let me say something on the political side. Uh, every U.S. president and all the political players involved in Cuba policy must deal with a hugely influential Cuban diaspora in the United States. Very little. I contrast that to Cuba and uh, to Europe, and I would ask the question: Has any election in Europe been determined by the Cuba issue? Thank you. Okay, uh, point made. Um, <laughs> uh, now, uh, we've had approaches by several presidents. President Clinton, as we heard today, tried to engage. He proposed several measures, charter flights, family travel, remittances, even post-Helms-Burton. Yes. Now, that's an important point, because even though Helms-Burton is the law of the land, you had President Clinton breaking out, if you choose. Uh, and then there was a quote by President Clinton that I couldn't resist writing down. Quote, I, I won't imitate the way he talks, the way he speaks English, but he says, every time we do something, Castro shoots planes down and kills people illegally or puts people in jail just because they say something he doesn't like. 
I almost think he doesn't want us to lift the embargo because it provides him an excuse for the economic failures of his administration. Quote, that's Bill Clinton, November 1999. Enter George Bush. A stylistic change, to be sure, and an explicit change with regard to certain measures. However, I'm impressed that nobody has mentioned one of the things that President Bush did early on in his administration. It was kind of, the re it was trying to use leverage uh, and uh, the policy, I believe it was first announced in 2002 in May or maybe 2003. Uh, no, it was 2002. The position was, if Cuba releases political prisoners and takes steps toward democracy, notice, takes steps toward democracy, President Bush pledged to work with the Congress to end the embargo. Of course, uh, also in the Bush administration, you had a lot of rhetoric. You had uh, the Cuba Transition Office um, looking at what would happen post-Cuba. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was a planning thing. It meant to mobilize the, the, uh, the U.S. bureaucracy. Uh, but I noticed in the Spanish presentation there was something that briefly reminded me of just the vestige of looking toward the future <laughs> and, and at, at, that, uh, at a transition that some people think will come. Now we have President Obama. In the campaign, he had promised family travel and an end to the remittance controls. He delivered. And at the Summit of the Americas in Trinidad and Tobago, he said, quote, the U.S. seeks a new beginning with Cuba. I know there is a long journey that must be traveled to overcome decades of mistrust, but there are crucial or critical steps that we can take to move toward a new day. And then we heard in the media just over the past several weeks, for days, messages sent by President Obama to the Foreign Minister of Spain and to President Lula. And one of them is, quote, tell Raul, if he doesn't take steps, I won't be able to go further. Close quote. Okay, that's kind of the backdrop that we find ourselves in today. Um, and uh, let's evaluate for a moment the U.S.'s approach, no, first the EU's approach and the U.S. approach. Um, any forward movement uh, with regard to professed pluralistic democracy and human rights objectives? We've heard today from this panel very little. Uh, some political prisoners let out. Hundreds are still incarcerated. Cuba signed two UN human rights agreements in 2008. But I don't think anyone is holding their breath with regard to implementation. Um, uh, d second question, does the European Union have any leverage now? with Raul in charge. Some say, no, no way, look at the record. Uh, I would submit there may be some potential leverage there, and that is by just continuing to engage in the process that the Europeans have been engaging in for a long time. And somewhere, and, may, and I haven't heard it, and I may be absolutely wrong, but out of the Moratinas visit, I thought I read that the Cubans had talked about having a human rights meeting in Cuba sometime next year. I don't know if that's true. If it were, if it were, it's an opportunity. Uh, it's, and, uh, and if there's European involvement in it, it's a huge opportunity. Um, a second way is uh, through NGOs and their reach to civil society throughout Europe, Spain, um, and cooperation there's a whole, there's a plethora of ways that uh, European uh, uh, entities do that. Uh, there are Cuba, there's cooperation with Cuba experts in third world countries uh, in immunization, primary health care, HIV AIDS, etc. By the way, much of this I gleaned from reading a very good article by Dan Erickson on, uh, on, 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 on Cuba. Uh, and uh, there's Dan. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, I recommend uh, Dan's work, uh, by the way. I don't agree 100% with everything he says, but I, 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 he's a treasure trove. Um, by the way, parenthesis, uh, once you're outside of government, you don't have anybody to do briefing papers for you, and uh, you have to do it all yourself so you, so, so, so you reach out to, 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 uh, to get the best. And uh, thank you all, because I will be reaching out to all of you. <laughs> uh, what about the Cuban reaction to what the European Union has done? You know, Cuba seems to be attuned to European Union real realities, both political and economic. Yeah, trade is important. Uh, 
there's ambivalence regarding investment, uh, and uh, it finds efforts to promote democracy, frankly, irritating. But Cuba sees the EU as a key player, not a decisive player, um, but an important player. And by the way, Cuba has other friends, China, Russia, Venezuela, uh, Brazil. And Cuba does reasonably well in terms of defending its interests at the, both the United Nations and at the OAS, even when, he's not, when, even when Cuba's not at the OAS. <laughs> okay. Now, here's a question. Has either the EU or the U.S. approach to Cuba worked? Well, on the economic side, it's worked for the EU, pretty much getting a lot of what it wants in Cuba, both trade and investment. Uh, on uh, the professed democracy and human rights interest side, no, not very much. How about on the U.S. side? Uh, well, we have uh, new agricultural economic interests, which has made the United States the fifth largest exporter to uh, trader with Cuba on the basis of uh, cash on the barrel head. Not a bad, not a bad way to do business. And uh, with uh, increased interest uh, on the part of our particularly with part of our citizens in the Midwest. Uh, with regard to democracy and human rights, the coercive approach uh, hasn't seemed to work. I would submit it's time for creativity uh, on both sides. Can we get to something together? I think we can continue to work on it. I think it's possible if we keep basics in mind, and uh, those basics include a continuing engagement on the human rights part of the agenda. Uh, and for the U.S., with this administration, it means continued reaching out in terms of visits. We'll have a presentation today by someone who has been to visit uh, to Cuba to visit uh, over the last uh, several weeks uh, from the United States government and the State Department. And there are different ways that we can begin to explore. Um, more, more travel. Um, Education, scholarships, uh, there could be ways uh, to, to follow through. Civil society contact is very important from the American point of view as well as the European. Um, and uh, with regard to both the United States and Europe, uh, the EU, continued consultation, more consultation. Uh, I would suggest using multilateral institutions, something like the Pan American Health Organization on Health. And by the way, uh, I really did like the suggestion of a multilateral approach on human rights. And I would like to make a suggestion. There is a way to do this and kill two birds with one stone through the Organization of American States, very simply, very simply, using the Inter-American Democratic Charter as a basis. And uh, there are three important European countries that are observers at the OAS, uh, Spain, France, and Italy. Uh, this could be done. It would be a real challenge. And by the way, it squares with that second paragraph of the OAS resolution in Honduras that talked about anything getting Cuba back into the system dependent upon the uh, Cuba adhering to OAS principles and practices. And this is what they were talking about. By the way, this was a huge diplomatic success for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and a defeat for some key countries in the hemisphere who really didn't want to move it in that direction. I won't go into details. It's all in the media. Um, so uh, there are things that can be done. Uh, what's, what's the alternative? Simply not engaging. Uh, that doesn't go with the way the current administration does business. I don't believe it's the way that the Congress of the United States is thinking at this time. Uh, it certainly isn't the way the European Union is thinking at this time. Uh, and in, uh, in diplomacy, it's a little bit like, you know, a long soccer match or a long American football game. Uh, and you've got to just keep on playing. But in diplomacy, you know, you don't have uh, an end to the game. The game just keeps going on. Uh, so uh, I think I, 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 I've spoken enough. Um, I will uh, uh, 
great, some great suggestions. I haven't had a chance to get to them maybe in the question and answer session. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, um, Ambassador, and thank you very much to the panelists. I'm not sure how strict we have to be with the, with the time. I would like to allow three questions and uh, a round uh, uh, feedback, and uh, um, then postpone the discussion for later on. Um, so, uh, please. Can we sum up three questions, second, third? Thank you. What, and then um, we give you the chance to uh, um, come back. So now, please. Yeah, I've heard a lot of <coughs> uh, from uh, Freedom Madrid. I've heard a lot on negative uh, incentives. I mean, I, th I, I think we should take this occasion because we have a new window of opportunity to talk to each other and to have an, uh, a more constructive debate beyond the stereotype uh, sanctions engagement thing. So I think uh, uh, that we have a new situation and we should really talk about the positive incentives. Why should Cuba, the Cuban regime, um, democratize? Where is the incentive? I mean, to be a member of the OAS? No, it's not a real incentive. We should maybe think about a multilateral initiative. What can we offer the Cuban regime to make it more attractive? We can't integrate Cuba into the European Union. This is our incentive model that works quite well. But we don't have anything com uh, comparable to this uh, with regards to Cuba. We are negative incentives only. So uh, I think uh, another problem is that we have a US policy, which is a kind of science fiction policy. It's like addressing the post-Castrism, but not the current situation. So, uh, and we have a European policy which is too conservative. It's only looking at, you talked about, I mean, it's not possible to have a long-term strategy, but at least we should have a debate what happens after Castro, after the two Castro brothers. We don't have this debate. We don't have a policy. And I think we should bring together these two very different focuses, and we have a real opportunity to do that. And my concrete question to uh, John Maest Maestro. Um, what will happen with the Helms Burton law? Nobody's talking about that. Sh Stephen Wilkinson, I very much agree with you, what you said. Um, and uh, what will happen with the, all these blueprints you developed uh, uh, for the uh, post castrism what, what happens with this Cuban transition coordinator? I did a meeting with, uh, with him. It doesn't exist anymore. But what will, uh, is happening with this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dan Erickson with Inter-American Dialogue. I enjoyed the presentations, particularly because I think I was criticized by the European panelists and praised by the American panelists, and usually it's the reverse. Uh, <laughs> so that was a welcome change. Uh, the question that I had, uh, I wanted to bring us back a little bit to 2003, uh, because that was really a, a key moment in the EU's relationship with Cuba. Uh, and thereafter, one of the uh, measures uh, that were taken was the EU was going to increase its relationship with dissidents in Cuba. Um, and there, thereafter, there's also what was known as the cocktail party wars, where whether or not dissidents should be invited to holiday parties at the embassies and would the Cuban government go and so forth, endured for some time. And so my question is, you know, where does the civil society or the dissidents fit now in terms of EU policy towards Cuba? Is it still viewed as a priority to have a relationship with these people, or are they seen uh, as basically uh, irrelevant? Uh, Moratinos and his recent visit to Cuba didn't meet with them. Um, and uh, and I, that's basically my question. Where does civil society fit into the equation? Thank you very much. My name is Sam Tyler, uh, samclicks.com. Uh, I really enjoyed these presentations, particularly uh, all of them, but particularly uh, the, the comparative study you laid out, uh, Stephen Wilkinson, uh, between the, U, uh, the EU and the United States. And my question is specifically about that. Um, you talked in, in the last point about uh, the United States and the EU should seek to converge, policy, uh, converge policies, but my question is, um, and, and the other thing that you mentioned was how important it was that the, the U, uh, EU policy didn't uh, uh, penalize or punish the, the, the population of, of Cuba. Uh, so my question is, how is it possible that these uh, po policies can converge when they're so divergent in, in their approaches? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to give the panelists the, the possibility to answer it. Um, Ambassador, you first, please. You have been, there was one anyway, a um, uh, direct question to you, but the others can refer to these questions as well. And thank you. With regard to what happens to the Cuba Transition uh, Commission, I suggest you ask that to the State Department representative who's going to be in the next panel. Um, I don't know. Um, with regard to, I'm, you know, there's this notion that because Helms-Burton is there, then nothing 
can be thought about from the U.S. point of view. I think we've had three U.S. presidents who, with Helms Burton under their belt, have made efforts. President Clinton did at the end of his administration. President Bush did. And President Obama is currently doing it. Let us not get hung up, please. Let us let the American political system wrestle with U.S. policy uh, internally. And uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I believe that it is the executive branch in our government that should lead our foreign policy. And I think we've had three separate efforts by three separate presidents to do just that with regard uh, to Cuba. And one is ongoing right now. And, uh, and uh, I would just wonder if, the, if um, Cynthia, you began with asking whether there's anything new with Raul Castro. I think there's a new opportunity. And I'm wondering um, if, uh, if the Cuban regime can take yes for an answer from the United States. Uh, I, I think it's an outstanding question. I think the ball is in their court. I think the <coughs> OAS put the ball in their court with that second paragraph of the Cuban resolution. I think the administration, uh, 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 President Obama did, uh, uh, and, uh, and we're waiting. Um, thank you. Stephen, would you like um I'll try and be very brief. How can they converge? Well, the, the clue, I mean, I think the clue is to look at what the Castro brothers have consistently said from day one, and that is that they are interested really in the question uh, to 19th century addiction to the idea of sovereignty and independence which they believe Cuba never had. They saw Cuba and sovereignty and independence being compromised after 1898 and 1902 by the United States hegemony over the island and their interest is simply to <coughs> uh, maintain the line that what happens inside our country is our affair and it's nothing to do with you. And that's the problem they had with the common position and it's the problem they have with Helms Burton. And Helms Burton is very explicit. It says no government that has any of the Castro brothers in it and the Communist Party has to be disbanded. If that is written into US law, they will use that as a stick to beat you with no matter what presidents do. So Helms Burton needs to be repealed, if possible, or some gesture has to be made to indicate that the executive branch does not like it, its intent, etc., etc. And you have to take the foot off the pedal and say, OK, you can be the government of Cuba if you want to be. We don't care anymore. Now, if you can get to that point, you will see that this will release an enormous amount of, uh, of, of uh, possibilities within the island for change, in my view because the adherence to this notion, this 19th century nationalistic notion, anti-colonial notion of independence and sovereignty at all costs is the crucial factor here. If you can let them be and let them govern, you may find they will govern in a way that you may appreciate more. So that, that's, that's my suggestion. Yes, as concerns Helms Burton, etc., I recommend to privilege the joint wisdom of Mr. Bancroft and Karl Marx. If you go to the Ministry of Commerce, go to the entrance number 10, you read a nice sentence. Trade rides every storm and invades every zone. That is recommendable. Second, Karl Marx said, money changes all. So if uh, US presidents, as they can largely, continue liberating the transfer of money, transfer of ideas by visits, and so on and so on, they can have an important impact, probably more than the EU as such can. The EU, yes, there is, there should be a window of opportunity, uh, but I'm not too confident uh, that, as I said, Q that the EU as such is so relevant for Cuba. Cuba takes a rather tactical approach to us. And I criticize the EU that we, answering Dan's question, have not done enough in our context with the opposition. For example, I do not understand why the US representative who is coming later, Visa, uh, could meet with the opposition and with Cuban authorities, whereas Cubans always tell us, 
your minister only can come if he refuses to meet with the opposition. I simply do, want, do not understand this. By the way, no minister in the EU has the obligation. Uh, the consensus of our text was always when appropriate. Okay. There are other. Uh, second, of course, let's not forget that uh, it is sad to say, but the, e the Cuban opposition cannot be compared to the Cuban dissidents, uh, to, the, to the political dissidents in Europe, in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so on and so on. No comparison whatsoever, unfortunately. Uh, this, by the way, also leads to the conclusion that what uh, rather hardline go governments uh, in Czech Republic and so on propose is not convincingly the only approach to promote transition. Um, well, what, well, in this context also I would say uh, do more without conditioning anything. Flood them with money and ideas and visits. I think the big failure of what is sometimes called the sequentialist approach, first steps you do and then I do the following step. This doesn't simply function. First, as I said in my uh, speech first, um, this makes us uh, possibly hostage to, uh, to Cuban veto. Second, you never agree on what is a first step and if that first step is sufficient. So you see, you waste your time. Yeah? Go ahead, flood them, as I said. Yeah? Um, we do something, however, in cooperation and trade. Um, in cooperation, I, I, I pointed out that we try to support reforms, as we did in the 90s already, reform of the economic efficiency, the possibility to deliver to improve daily grievances in the population, the possibility to improve infrastructure. As I said, all this can be interpreted, if one wishes, to stabilize the system. On the other hand, we are confident long-term development is a better basis for more democratic societies. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, uh, I will be very short because they ask, uh, they, they answer everything. But I want to talk about the, the window of opportunity too. I think it's sometimes we expect very, sh mm, very fast changes in Cuba, and the, the changes in Cuba can be fast. The, the time in Cuba is different, and they take their time to do these changes. So if we, we expect to have very change is very, very fast, it's, it's, this is exhausting and this is doesn't work. Uh, so it should be seen uh, in the long term, medium term, long term. But, and I want to say something about the transition. This, uh, I think the transition will be what you don't know is in what direction. So <laughs> you, you, you need to try to, to <coughs> push to one direction and not to another. Uh, but the transition will be because it's, it's, it's natural, it's the time. No? to change in, in this moment. So about the, Mora <coughs> the, the visit of Moratinos to and the, the, um, the dissidents. Well, he was asked in the Congress by the opposition, of course, because they do everything <laughs> every time, no? And uh, because they say the dissidents were, were humiliated and uh, all that. But uh, the answer of Moratinos is uh, that, well, we have two different relations. One is the official with the government and the other is another channels with the opposition, with the dissident. So we have we maintain the two contexts but in different moments. So this is the, the duality, the not the duality <laughs> I say. <laughs> but they continue to work with the, the, the dissidents. And um, well in, I think I don't know what to say more. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Um, I think the next panel is waiting, so thank you very much for your contribution and for your comments. Please join me in a hand of applause for this uh, presentation. <laughs> We're going to have a, a brief break now, and um, then we uh, going to have a new um, panel on the hemisphere and Cuba. And I'm, I'm, let me add a, cup, a note or two that I yeah, didn't no, make. I can, okay. send you one single word. I can send you by email. Thank you. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Are you available?
Congratulations. Right. Did you to, uh, stay for lunch? Oh, absolutely. Great. Uh, I think I arranged for a column. You have a column on the I saw you on the record. Uh, for, for more just I'd like to I don't have a card, unfortunately, because they just give me this new job and they haven't printed my new card. Um, but I can, I can give you, I can write it down for you. Um, I I wrote an article which was published in the June issue of um, a journal called Diplomacy and Statecraft. I will definitely track that down. Okay, which is really about UK policy towards Cuba in relation to the United States and the differences there has been since 1959. Right. Over. You, you also mentioned the repeal of Helms Burton, and I, I don't know. Uh, what, two questions. What do you think the likelihood of that is going to be? What additionally? Uh, can well, they do to sort of convert? Repealing Ellsworth is almost impossible right now, but my feeling is that um, eventually there has to come a there, there, there must come a point when the the conflict between the lobby in Florida and the Obama administration will become open. I say that because it seems to me that they are um, on a trajectory of confrontation, which is going to, which is going to be forced out into the open eventually. I don't know uh, whether or not uh, it's going to happen anytime soon, but I think that ultimately the the situation will become one in which the president will have the opportunity to make a very clear statement about what his attitude is towards Cuba. And when he does that, he can, he can say something which says that we, you know, we don't think this approach to Cuba is any more relevant. Because they can't repeal the law, but he can say it. And he thinks it's, it, it is against the US national interest. And that as far as he's concerned, he's going to ignore it or work against it. Okay. In other words, he'd throw the challenge to Congress and say to Congress, if you stop me from this, okay? you stop me from this, it's up to you, you pass the law, you enforce it. Let's see if you can get a majority to, to impeach me, stop me from doing what I want to do with Cuba. And then he can then begin to make policy on Cuba with a free hand. Because then, then he, will be re he will be retaining the executive power to make foreign policy. Now, if he does that, the signal that would send to the Castros is we can deal with this guy because he's not going to listen to his Florida Thank you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a psychological thing. And the other thing is, and the other thing is that they, the Castros, are pragmatic. They reformed that. In the early 90s, they, they threw out. They, they, they engaged with foreign countries. They are happy to deal with foreign countries. Guys from Venezuela they're dealing with, they're all capitalists. The Venezuelan state isn't, you know, okay, the, the, the oil companies take control, but all of the other business people they're dealing with the Venezuelan They will deal with capitalists. And everybody who deals in the Caribbean, they will reform their system. They don't want it to face a situation where they think they are being undermined with the purpose of removing them. That's why, that's why they are thinking about the United States. The United States And if the United States would just drop that, say, okay, let's talk, let's, let's deal with you, then, then you will find without making any linkages, that they will, I believe, reform their system. They will begin to reform their system. But they want to be in charge. And the people that are running the country now want to be in charge when it changes. Now, that means that sooner or later, the whole has to be faced down. It has to be faced down. They have to be told, Forget it. You're not going back. You're not going to have. The, you're not going to have the land back. Here, have this money. It was fun doing it. It was getting ready yeah, to do. Why do you think that this kind of conversation? Uh, sometimes in Europe, here in 
from time to time. Yes. Yes. Possibly. Oh, okay. But, but if you are uh, in Europe, I think it's. I think it's. You've got. I would. I think you've got three problems. Yeah. You've got I would. I would. I would. Since you are in Europe, well, I think you've got three problems in the United States. I was just in. I was just in Paris. Like, okay. And if you want to invite me, that's fine. You guys down there did this thing to us, and we can't forgive you for it. So that. That, so in other words, the embargo is a symbolic thing. It's like saying, look, this is a demonstration. We don't like this kind of behavior from countries in this part of the world. So we're not going to deal with you. you. You can forget it, you guys. You can forget it. What you did was bad behavior, and we don't like it. Now, I can't get rid of you, but hell, we're not going to talk to you. We're not going to deal with you. We're not going to sell anything to you. We're going to treat you like pariahs, because that is what you deserve for being so uppity. OK? So that that attitude, that attitude is remnant, it's very interesting. Though. Is a remnant, okay? Yeah. So that has to, now Obama is the man who can change that because of course. Yeah. How are you doing, Norman? How are you? Good to the see thing you. Is, to you. is that <laughs> Obama as a black man also has the potential to appeal over the heads of the Cuban government to the people because the majority of Cubans are black. Sure, and they identify very strongly with Obama. They had a, an aspirational view of Obama. They saw him as potentially lifting this thing, stopping and ending this thing. So he has tremendous play within the Cuban population. Now, if he does it right, he could affect a lot. And that would be by, by you know, he fell into the trap again by saying, tell Raul Castro that I can't do anything more if he doesn't do something. Well, that means to Raul saying, well, you know, you're you, you not good to me. You know, what I want to see from you is, I want to do something, and I don't care about the consequences. But, but he didn't. He said, no, I can't do anything. It's going to take too much heat or whatever. I am, you know, I've got no possibility of making any more changes. You've got to make some changes. Well, they'll never respond to that. The Castros will not respond to that. Because that is like conditionality. Like, you, you'll do this, you do this. You do. They won't do that. Do that. They want it unrelated. They will do it. They want it unrelated. You don't tie it to it. Don't say it. Keep it out of the public eye. That's what they've got. And it's got to be a cool thing. Mark, it's got to be cool. The, the US has got to be really cool. It's got to say, it's got its goals. It's, it's aims. Keep its aims, but keep the powder dry and just forget all the posturing and telling the Cubans. That, well, I think it would work. I think it would work because even if it's a psychological know, thing. The conditions were different. Than but you see, the thing is, you can try it and then change again. You see, the point is, is that without even saying it, what you could do is get yourself into a position where you could say. But the point is, the point is, if you if you say, okay, I'll let all the Americans travel to Cuba tomorrow, and I will, and I will let American companies invest in tourism. Immediately, that changes the game completely. Okay. Now, two years later, the Cubans arrest a lot of dissidents. So you say, "Oh no, that's not the right behavior at all." Yeah, but they—they they can. We're going to we're going to stop we're going to stop our tourists coming to Cuba. If you do that again, we're going to stop our tourists coming to Cuba. We, no, you will then you have a sanction against them. Yes. Because if they don't behave themselves, if they don't behave themselves. Then you can. No, you can, I think you can, you can, you can set the means of Cubans but then it, would not American be able. American citizens are going to, to Cuba. Normal American citizens can't prohibit them from going. Yeah, no, it's impossible. We are living in other if, countries. If the Cubans did, if the, if the Cuban government did something that that no, was fundamentally in contrary to human rights, they could do. They could take sanctions. You could do that, but you have a lot of uh, internal opposition. Well, you may have some internal opposition, but you'd, you'd be right. You'd be morally justified. Oh, I'd like I mean, to have it. Uncanny. Oh, good. No, on, on EU, US policies, and I can see they're very similar. Oh, you did. Oh, where excellent. You, but I did it in German, so I don't. I can't. Where, where are you, Susanna? I'm a, we met at the NASA conference. Oh, we yeah. did. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It didn't say so much. So. It was <laughs> the, the heat. The heat of the. Um, that's right. Well, that's in front of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, my, I did an article in. Um, maybe you were in, in June. In June, I published it in Diplomacy and Statecraft, the journal. 
Yeah. No, I did an article on the history of the UK relationship with Cuba, mm -hmm. and it's I think it's okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you should have been here. Huh? On the panel. Yeah, I know, but this was more about. Uh, Thank you. Explanation. Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pardon me for interrupting. So maybe I thought maybe we could do something together. Yeah, that would be nice. Oh, sounds great. If you come to, you ever come to England? No. You never yeah, come to I England. spend a night in London, Once. thanks to British Airways. So I only spend one night here. I, I'm going back today. To, to, to Germany? No, I'm living in Spain. In Spain? I'm not okay. I was going to say, if we had some money, we could invite you to London to give a paper. Yeah. Money is a problem. Money is always a problem. I was the university uh, well, Gene Starbs kind of. Yeah, yeah well, well really um, Jose, uh, the, the problem is that um, uh, now it's improving, but Jean left. Right. She took the voluntary redundancy. Yeah, I remember that she was. Uh, and. Um, the center was folded then into this initiative. Yeah. That's what I, was, I, I lost track. I, yeah. I lost well, we kind of fudged it. Well, Which meant I kept my job. Yeah. Uh, I think Jean Leeming helped because it meant that they saved money on her. She had a big salary for yeah, a long time. Um, and so, uh, but then they needed someone to teach her courses. So they they kept me, so I'm teaching her courses. Now you're like up to here. But I enjoy that. Hi, how you doing? I enjoyed it. Hi, I just want to. I'm, 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 actually, I'm not sure if we have. My name's Mary Speck. I'm actually an historian yeah. working at NAD now. Oh, good. Um, so I was interested at. at, at I'm still in Dallas for the moment. Right, right. I was oh, visiting. Right. Well, I'm okay. actually looking for the historical project actually on Cuba in the 1950s, uh, making talking about the breakdown of democracy. Well, there was certainly, uh, certainly a lot of civil liberties, certainly a very vociferous and very aggressive press. And, uh, well, of course, the, 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 the original aim is to was to restore the 1940 Constitution. And of course, the reason for the first splits against him was that he reneged on that promise. So, yes. You, I mean, had, you had problematic competitive elections. I mean, it wasn't that different from the rest of this. Not at all. There's a lot of talk about <laughs> Well, one would say that it functioned fairly well. Yeah. I mean, the first, in the 1940s, it functioned very well. Uh, it began to uh, fall apart in the 50s. Well, in 1952. Yeah, well, I mean, the late, late, late 1940s, early 50s. Well, you always had similar almost to Argentina, very violent uh, university students having shootouts, a lot of. break the leg. Yes. Huh? I mean, it was just functional in a way to other people. I only have any government. Do you know if the order is here? Huh? So, am I, am I starting? Or? If everyone could please take his or her seat, we're going to be starting our second panel. Thank you. Cynthia, am I first? Uh, I actually don't know. Huh? Yeah, I'm out of so Lisa goes first. So Lisa I'm going to do it from here. All right. Then you go, you go next. Lisa, Carlo, Jorge, Jorge Dan, 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 and that's the same. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. All right. Please tackle. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Wonderful. I usually have that much hair. Hi, Brian. 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 Hi,
Thank you. That's right. Yes, we did. I kind of think it's been a while. That's where. Yeah, really? uh, that's right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'd like to. Uh, I don't think so. I think it'll be rather. <laughs> please take your seats. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, welcome to the second panel of this uh, discussion. We'll be focusing our conversation now on uh, Western, the Western Hemisphere and Cuba. With us we have a distinguished panel. Um, I won't go into uh, introductions of the speakers. You actually have a, you have a speaker bios. Uh, we'd like to begin with Bisa Williams uh, from the U.S. State Department. Please. Good morning. Am I on? Yes. Um, I apologize I had to miss the first part of this session, but I want to commend everybody for putting it together. Can I also preface my statements by saying we were told um, in our email this could be on or off the record. I'd like this to be off the record. All right. Understood, everyone? Yes. I'll be as candid as uh, those of you who know me know that I always am. So, what, one second. It's being webcast. So if that's a problem, <laughs> we, can, we can turn off the webcam during your presentation, but, but uh, just uh, that's an anomaly there. So would sure. you prefer that the cameras are Hello, around? everybody out there, but you'll have to um, get word from other people. Yeah, I'd like to okay, not to be webcast. So we'll, we'll stop the webcast. And uh, are there other? There are I realize TV, that's a body blow to the TV State Martins Department. Is here but, uh, as well, off as well? Yes. Um, you know, I, I apologize. I didn't vet this through our system, and I've got to have it off the record. Okay, off the um, record. No. Off the record. No TV camera. Going. Sure. Hello, hello. Yeah. No, no. Okay. No. Uh, <laughs> this will help, um, as I said, to have us have a really candid. Um, there is a back and forth in this, sure. isn't there? Sure. Discussion, sure, sure. and um, and I'd really appreciate that, and our administration would really appreciate that. Um, so, although there were.